In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As many of you know, one of the things that I really enjoy doing in the summertime is sailboat racing. And this summer, uh, the crew and I have decided to take on a particularly ambitious race that we've never done before called the Lake Ontario 300. It's a famous race because it's the longest freshwater race in the world. It's 300 kilometers. You sort of zigzag across Lake Ontario. It takes a couple of days to do it. It's a test of endurance and uh, mental and sort of spiritual fortitude as much as it is uh, whether you've made the right choices about your equipment or you're particularly well trained or anything like that. My role on the crew will be to be the, basically the first mate and also the navigator and tactician. Now, I love being a navigator. It's one of the main kind of metaphors for how I understand my life and my ministry. I love the challenges that navigation provides us. And I think it makes actually a pretty good metaphor for what we're about at Messiah, but I'll get into that in a minute. First, let's start with like how you navigate. Now, a lot of people just imagine that it's as easy as pushing a few buttons on a GPS computer and you get your result and you know where you are and everything is hunky-dory. But like any electronic device, GPS will fail you from time to time. And there's some other problems as well. For example, off the coast of, of Baja, there's an area where the charts that are in your computer do not line up with what's actually there. And there have been a lot of cases of people who blindly followed their computers into the beach. So in a place like that, you need to have some other skills, some of the traditional skills of navigation. One of the most famous is celestial navigation. When you do celestial navigation, what you do is you take measurements of things like the stars and the sun and the moon, and you measurements of time, and you do a lot of math, and I mean a lot of math. And at the end of that, you have a fix, a, a position on the globe where you know that you are, and you mark that dutifully on your map. The problem, of course, with celestial navigation is it takes a long time. There's a lot of math involved. You have to take all those measurements and so on. The other problem with celestial navigation is, what do you do if it's cloudy? <laughs> Well, the answer is nothing, except resort to other methods of navigation. The most important of which, fundamental, no matter whether you want to rely on a computer or not, you still have to learn how to do something called dead reckoning. The way dead reckoning works is basically, if you know how fast you're going and in what direction and for how long, then you know that if you start off in point E, you're probably somewhere near point B by the end of that time period. So the way it works is you start again with a fix, some location that you know you are on the map, and then you head in one direction, and you try to stay in that same direction. And meanwhile, you take a record of how fast you're going every couple of minutes on a regular interval. Then you average that speed, and you take your stopwatch. You know how long you've gone in that direction. And then you make a little line from point A to point B, the direction you're heading. And you do the calculation of the distance you did, and you make a little thing there. And you put a DR next to it for dead reckoning, so you know it's really just a kind of an estimate or a guesstimate of where you went. And in that way, you can kind of make a little trail for yourself, called a track. Well, if you're really good at it, you can even do this in really dangerous circumstances. In fact, people often have to do this when you're in a, a narrow channel, maybe in the fog, where you have not a lot of external markers to look at to get a new fix of where you might be. Sometimes, uh, piloting Messiah feels like that. You know, you get these occasional uh, glimpses where the fog has lifted and you see a, 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 maybe a mountain in the distance or an object, a water tower, something that you can you know, take a bearing on and get a sense of where you might be. We are, after all, a God only knows parish, according to the diocese. Nobody knows where Messiah is heading. This big ship just kind of goes through the night and everybody sort of tries to stay out of the way, it seems, in some ways. But, of course, I don't believe that to be true. I think we're heading in a direction. You might recall last Lent when I had uh, what I really think was a, was a Holy Spirit vision of where we can move forward as a congregation. And I articulated that many times in the last uh, months since then. Uh, but the basic idea is to become a mixed economy parish, meaning that we would continue to have a thriving Sunday morning community, but we'd have other expressions of community and of church as well, most particularly creating a third space cafe church kind of thing out of space here. And a few other initiatives too, like Messiah Market and Messiah Media and, and so on, but I won't go into those today. But you know, navigation, at the end of the day, is all about observation. Really what you're doing is you're looking outside of your own little boat towards something else in the environment, toward the exterior, as a way of understanding your own situation. Navigation is about observing the things that are outside of you to understand something about your own situation. 
And we at Messiah are continually called to do that, and we've done that in a number of ways. You know, we, we took a look at our community by doing a, a survey, a marketing survey. We've taken a look at uh, the health of our congregation by using NCD and other tools. And you know, continually we do that from time to time, every couple of weeks or months. We sort of take a look outside of ourselves and try to fix on something and make an observation and an inference of what that might mean. But of course, the ultimate trick of it is not just to look around us in a kind of like a lateral way, but to look above us, going back to celestial navigation, toward the Messiah whom we proclaim. There's a reason why we've named these initiatives using the word Messiah, Messiah Media, Messiah Market, Messiah Commons, because at the end of the day, we want to center them in a vision of Christ, in what academics call Christology, which is the study of what we mean when we say Jesus, what we mean when we say he is the Messiah, the Christ. Consider the passage that we have today from, from uh, Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus is baptized. One of the interesting things is that this version of the baptism is a little bit different from some of the other ones. Uh, one of the big kind of, not controversial questions, but, but differences between the texts is this uh, question of the sign that Jesus himself receives, where it says, a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Well, according to Matthew, that's actually a pretty private experience that Jesus has alone. It says, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. What are we to make from that? Did he tell the story to his disciples years later about the experience he had, the sign that he received, that his ministry was to begin, the, the vision of the Holy Spirit, which we, of course, you know, uh, develop later in Christianity as a notion of what God's Spirit is like in the world? And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And if Jesus did testify to this himself, why did the disciples accept his testimony and remember it? Well, probably because they already knew him to be the Son of God. They didn't need the sign to learn that. In fact, the sign doesn't seem to have a whole lot of impact on the people around him. In Matthew's Gospel, immediately after this happens is when Jesus goes off by himself into the desert to do his whole purification, uh, temptation, uh, ritual in the desert. This sort of vision quest that he goes on before this ministry starts in earnest. I would contend that we as a community are about something similar, that we look for these signs from heaven, even if they're perceptible only to ourselves, and even if there is a certain uh, distance between what we know to be true and what we can convince others of. Uh, not too long ago, I was having a conversation about this church with somebody who's not a member of this church, uh, but is in a leadership position, and I was trying to convince them of, of the, the, the sort of spirituality of this community, and they had a hard time sort of believing it in a way, because their notion of who we are was stuck in, in something that might have been true 10 or 15 years ago. And of course, they don't worship with us. They, they have no idea. All they see is a, is a graph of declining numbers over the years or something like that. And I was trying to convict them of the passion that I think this community has for being relevant. And it was a little tricky. Another example of that same kind of distance um, in the back of the leaflet, and you can look at it later, there's a series of logos that were developed as, as possible starting places for rebranding the church's image that it, that it projects to the community around it. And you know, we had these conversations with the designers about what we wanted, and you notice in all those logos, you see church sort of prominently. And usually church is even bigger than Messiah in these things. You know, the church of the Messiah. And actually, I wanted to be the Church of the Messiah, right? It's kind of what I had in mind. And I realized it's because the designer who took this on, when he looks at us and, and what we described about ourselves, what he still saw in his mind was a very traditional church and all the things that go with that. And what we're about is actually something quite a bit more challenging. We're forging new ground as we work together to be a relevant harbinger of Christ to this community. So what I want to challenge us with is, how do we do that work of navigation, of, of looking up at the stars and seeing in them some heavenly sign? The thing about celestial navigation is that it does require some skillfulness. It's, it's all about the skilled interpretation of observations. So what skills do we need that we don't already have? I don't know. Whose job is it to look up at the stars after all anyway? Well, I think it's a collective job that we all do. So now I'm going to open this up a bit and, and ask you all to explore with me what, what are some of the ways in which we can make these observations that, that orient us to where we are and where we're headed. 